Hi, I'm Bill Geisley of Geisley Automatics, and today this video is being shot to show you our new rail system. It's called the Super Modular Rail, or SMR. Geisley Automatics is known for its national match and combat triggers, and this is a new product for us. A little bit of background on it. We were asked by a government entity to design a rail for their HK416 weapon. The HK416 is made in Germany and it's basically a reverse engineered M4 carbine with a little bit of German pixie dust thrown on it, which is very good. It's a good weapon. Uh, but our customer had some issues with the rail that was on it, namely that it was not ergonomic and they didn't like that. So they asked us to design a rail and we did. And as we were designing that rail, in consultations with them and other people uh, of our customers, other customers, uh, they mentioned how about an M4 rail? And so at the same time, we designed a rail for the M4 carbine, an AR-15. And today, we're gonna show you that. Now, there's about 40 other companies in the United States and in Asia that make these type of hand guards or rail systems for the AR-15. We are not, we have no exclusivity to this. There's just 40 people. And people have been making this for a long time. Generally, in the 90s, the only rail systems, and I say this completely from some part of ignorance because my background is high power rifle. And the only rails that I knew of back then were, there were some military type rails, but in the civilian market, you had something like this. This is a, uh, a free-floating tube that goes under uh, an A2 upper for service rifle competition. This one here, I believe, is made by Compass Lake Engineering. And what it does, just to give you a little background, it'll actually fit. This is my service rifle right here. It'll actually fit underneath these modified handguards and provide a free floating barrel. It doesn't look like it, but that front sight base is clamped to the barrel. These handguards do not fit around and actually this sheet metal piece does not actually touch the barrel. That is part of that handguard. There were also a lot of handguards out there that were like this one. Again, my background, match, high power rifle. This is a, a match rifle. Again, this rail here was made by Compass Lake Engineering. It's very tubular, it's strong, it provides a, uh, a free floating mechanism for the barrel on this, on this weapon. Approximately 10, 12 years ago, what became popular and generally available is something like this. This is known as a quad rail and it has four Picatinny rails, or M1913, that's the military designation of it, rails at four quadrants. It's, it's very, very good in a, lot of, in a lot of ways. For one thing, you can attach your flashlights, your lasers, different, different attachments to it. You can attach it wherever you want. The top rail generally is even with the upper receiver. And then you have a bottom rail that you can put a bipod on or a vertical foregrip. Then you have your two side rails. This became very popular about 10 or 12 years ago. The majority of the rails that are out there are this type. What we have is something called a modular rail. It's not new. I'm told, and I don't have first-hand knowledge of this, that there is a modular rail from the 1960s in Mr. Reed Knight's armament museum in Florida. So even back in the 60s this concept was thought of. What a modular rail is, it gives you fle more flexibility than the quad rail and it's much more ergonomic. Now when you look at a rail system, if you're going to design one, there's nine broad design specifications for a rail and all of these have to be met in order for it to be a good rail. First, the rail has to be rigid, 
Second, it has to be strong. Third, it has to be ergonomic. Fourth, it has to be free floating. It has to be flexible and modular. It has to be easy to install, easy to remove. The accessory rails have to be easy to install and the accessory rails have to be strong. And I'm gonna talk about the Geisley SMR and show you how it meets these nine design specifications and how it becomes what I believe is an extremely good rail for the military and for the combat and tactical shooter. This rail right here is the HK416 rail that we designed for the U.S. military. Um, HK has taken uh, their rail design and they've put a lot of thought into their rail design and in a lot of ways it's an extremely good rail out there. There are some things that aren't as good and that's the reason why we made this, um, but our design is heavily influenced by it. I'll be the first to admit that uh, some of the things that you're going to see here are not Bill Geisley's ideas. I may have executed them very well, but others, going back to the 1960s, have thought of some of these things. Okay, as Isaac Newton said, he said, I stand on the shoulder of giants, and that applies here. Um, this is my rock on the pile, per se, and there'll be others after me with their rocks. Let's take this box here and I'll show you what comes in the box. We have a rail, in this case, a 15 inch. We have an assembly drawing. And there's an accessory packet. And let's go through what's in this accessory packet right off the bat. Each rail comes with its own barrel wrench. This is our design right here. And what this wrench will do is it'll put on our proprietary barrel nut and it will also take off the stock barrel nut. And if you so desire, when you're working on your gun, it also has bottle opener. In case you want some liquid refreshment when you're working on your firearm. It also has three accessory rails, one with three screws, two with two, has a selection of screws for it, and the Allen wrenches that you need in order to install this. Each rail comes with a set of written instructions, and it also comes with an assembly drawing here and I'm gonna pick this, a bigger copy of this assembly drawing up so you can see. Now this is all laid out, okay? Here we have our barrel, our barrel nut wrench. Here's the Geisley barrel nut, which replaces the stock barrel nut. You have your rail, you have two cross bolts, you have your two anti-rotation screws, which are optional. And you have your accessory rails with its associated screws. When you look at the rail, first thing you can do, pull out your screws. They are uh, already installed, lightly installed. And you can pull your barrel nut out. Now if you notice, Notice what kind of a tight fit this is, and that's designed that way. First design specification of a good rail. It's got to be rigid. What we've done is we've put a lot of rigidity in this rail through the use of our proprietary barrel nut. It's real easy to make a rail. I shouldn't say real easy. It's, it's cheaper to make a rail if you use the stock barrel nut. If you use this, the customer doesn't have to remove it. Um, you don't have to include it with it, which of course, it's gonna be a heck of a lot cheaper of a rail system. But one problem with this is if you look at this, this was not designed in order to have a cantilever load applied to it. 
This is a Colt 6920 carbine, basically the civilian version of the M4. We have our standard handguards right here that are held on with the delta ring, and these handguards basically come together and clamp on a sheet metal piece that's attached to the barrel. This is not a free-floating setup. The barrel nut, the standard barrel nut on the M4 and M16 is not designed for loads where you take it and you pry on it like this, like a cantilever. The stock barrel nut have a, has 11 sixteenths of surface area here that you can locate on in order to locate a free floating type two. The Geisley barrel nut has two and a quarter inches. This isn't high level engineering or rocket science here. If you take a load and you're gonna pry on it out here with a bipod or with the weight of a laser or something like that, you don't wanna have a skinny little barrel nut right here to resist those loads. Okay, that's, that's intuition. You wanna have a nice long barrel nut with a lot of surface area to keep that rigid. And that's where a lot of the rigidity of this uh, handguard system comes from. The handguard has to be strong. And by that I mean there are loads applied to it in the field that can actually break a handguard. If handguards are in multiple pieces or they're pieced together, falling on rocks, having your gun fall off your vehicle, even though you don't want that to happen, it happens. Handguards can break, physically break. And I've had people, some of my customers tell me about how they've broken in use in the field, and these are military customers. Or they can become bent and your zero of your front sight or your laser can become changed. So the, the handguard needs to be strong. And again, with proper design of the profile and with this long barrel nut, you have a very strong handguard. Handguard has to be ergonomic. Gripping around a cheese grater like this, it's not ergonomic. You can put little rubber covers in here. There are covers that go onto the top of this so you don't have to grab onto this. But as soon as you do that, this quad rail starts getting bigger and bigger in diameter and it no longer will fit your hand comfortably. You also have tremendous area right here with tremendous potential for sharp edges. Deburring this long Picatinny rail right here might seem like a no-brainer, but it's actually can add some sort of cost to your quad rail, and a lot of companies don't really even bother to deburr that. And when you're gripping it, it's sharp as can be. And even though it might not seem that you mind it, subconsciously, gripping something sharp like that is throwing your subconscious concentration off because your hand knows that something here can damage it. The Geisley rail right here is appropriately sized. As you can see in my hand, it fits it comfortably. It's not too narrow. There are rails out there that are as slim as a pencil and they're extremely narrow. This is made for a normal sized man's hand. The nine o'clock, the six o'clock, and the three o'clock quadrants are sections that are rounded. This has a rounded profile right here. You are not gripping against something that has a strange profile with nubs or something like that that your hand is going to feel that it doesn't feel correctly. When you grip this, it's natural. It points natural. It feels good. It's very smooth. We take a lot of care in deburring these handguards so that when you feel this, this is silky smooth. Handguard has to be free floating. If you don't have a handguard that's free floating, like this one is not, Applied loads to the handguard are going to shift your point of impact of your barrel. This is a known fact. Uh, it's one of the reasons why this handguard came out here. There is no way you're going to shoot a service rifle with any type of accuracy with a sling unless you have a free floating barrel. It goes for bipods also. You put a bipod on there and you don't have a free floating, free floating tube or rail on there your point of impact is going to change 
And also, for a military application, you could have devices on your handguard like a laser, but now their point of impact is going to change. So what you need is a free-floating handguard. And that means that the barrel has to go through the center of the handguard without anything touching it. The barrel has to be free. The handguard needs to be flexible and modular. This is design specification number five. What that means is you want to be able to put your accessories on this handguard or not put them on the way you want it. You can put an accessory rail here on the bottom. You put them on the side. Here's a two screw one right here. Wherever you want to put this, you can. You can set this here and you can put a QD sling swivel attachment on here, which I might add down the road. We're going to have a QD sling swivel attachment so that you screw this right in. You don't have to add something to it. But this is flexible. You set it up the way you want to set it up. If you want to shoot three gun with it and you don't want anything on here, you don't need a flashlight, you don't need a laser or anything like that, don't put it on. If you need to attach things, you can go ahead and do it. The sixth design specification is rail has to be easy to install. I am completely against mechanical voodoo. And if you've been around ARs or mechanical things, you'll, you'll know that sometimes you can have a, an accessory or something that needs to be installed and instead of a straightforward installment, pro installment process, you have basically this nightmare of a process where you need possibly a very expensive special tool, possibly expensive things to align it, maybe a fixture. Um, you need a lot of work and a lot of difficulty goes in to installing it to the point that once you get it on, you never want to take it off. It could be a couple hour long process to do it necessarily with a rail, it could be with anything. So the handguard has to be easy to install. You want to be able to do this in your workshop without a lot of special tools. And we'll talk about that as we go through the installation of this. The handguard has to be easy to remove. And this is one area where this handguard shines. You might say, why do I need to remove it? Every other rail I have is on here. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't get removed. Well, one thing that you can do is you can have multiple handguards for different applications. In other words, you can have one that's bare. You can have one with flashlights on it. And I'm going to show you how you can pull a handguard on and off in about a minute and put the other one back on. For a military application, you can have different lasers on one, different sighting system, something else mounted to it, and in one minute, essentially almost without tools except for a small allen key you can turn put this handguard on and off the eighth design specification refers to your accessory rails which are these right here they have to be easy to install some accessory rails go on and there's a tape of a nut that goes underneath it and that nut is extremely difficult to put down inside your rail get in place and then somehow get the screw started okay sometimes you got to put this thing in and hold this thing and fool with it while you put this on and then try to get your screw started it can be very difficult this rail here has points along it that have chrome molly steel inserts that go into the aluminum and all you do in order to install your accessory rail you put it on you take your screw and a supply down key. And away you go. Done. You put your other one on. Your accessory rail is right where it's at. You want to take it off, just remove it. The last design specification is the accessory rails have to be strong. Some accessory rails attach to the handguard strictly with screws or bolts. In other words, they can slide right along here. Our accessory rails have two small precise machine bosses that fit into these grooves. And what that does is when this goes in, the accessory rail cannot twist nor can it slide. The only thing that the screws do is hold it on. So applied loads from let's say a flashlight and you fall on it or something like that, 
They are not going to twist your screws and they're not going to loosen up. Those applied loads go into these bosses or shear lugs and all that screw does is it holds it on. Now, my background is mechanical engineering. I'm also a machinist. I started in a machine shop when I was 15 years old. Uh, I was taught much of what I know by a man named Michael DiNardo and, uh, in Blue Anchor, New Jersey. And if you're from Philadelphia, you'll hear his son on KYW Radio. He's a, he's a radio announcer. Now, Mike DiNardo was pretty much the smartest man I've ever known. And he taught me a tremendous amount. So my background is not only engineering. I went to Rutgers in New, in New Brunswick, New Jersey. That's where I'm originally from, in New Jersey. But it's also machining. I can do both. As an engineer, you want to be able to develop your specifications and you want to be able to write those down. And it's very important when you try to design something. And I'm going to give you a little uh, thing, an, an incident here, where I've found how important these design specifications are and then it's important to execute it properly. And this is why I developed these nine specifications for a rail. I did a lot of work uh, in the mining industry. I worked in the mining industry building uh, uh, rock, rock, basically rock grinders, ball mills, machines that will take rock and turn it into a powder so that the copper and gold can be extracted. I did a lot of work in Asia, in China, Vietnam, in Indonesia. And I grew to enjoy green tea. It's a little bit different in Asia than what we drink here in a tea bag. Basically, they take green tea leaves and put it in a small plastic cup, and they take hot water from a water cooler and make green tea out of it. And I grew to enjoy it. And, you know, it's supposed to be healthy for you, so I tried to get my wife to, to drink green tea. And she just, she's from Pittsburgh, she's an all-American girl, and having these green tea leaves floating around in this cup just skeeved her out. She didn't like it. One day I was at the supermarket and I saw a really nice teapot. And one day I was at the supermarket and I saw a really nice, a really trick teapot. For making tea and this was a beautiful beautiful ceramic teapot and it had a very intricate stainless steel strainer that would snap inside it so you could put your tea leaves in pour your hot water in it would brew and then you could pour it and these tea leaves would not come out into your tea and it, would, it made about two cups and I said this is perfect I'll take this home my wife and I'll sit there in the evening we'll enjoy a green tea and I bought this teapot the pot I dropped about $24, I think, on it. Took it home, put the tea leaves in, brewed it with the stainless steel mesh in it, made two cups. And then I went to pour the tea out. And as soon as I tilted this thing, the top of this teapot popped off and tea started to come out of the top and puked all over the counter. It didn't even come out of the spout yet, as it was coming out of the spout. And I realized the design of this teapot, even though it was two cups, you might be able to put a cup in it, and that was it. Now, you look at the design specifications for a teapot, and, you know, I haven't developed one, but if you look at it, you know, okay, it's, you know, ceramic is a good thing to, to use. You look, you talk about the, the stainless steel strainer, you want that made appropriately, you want it perforated appropriately. One of the things is, of course, when you go to pour tea out of the thing, you don't want it to puke all over the counter. One thing out of the design specification on this teapot that I thought was the most perfect teapot in the world didn't work. And now that teapot is essentially unusable. I don't use it. It sits in the cabinet. I could brew. We don't, we don't drink green, green tea anymore at our house, but there's other ways to do this. And that teapot will eventually find its way to a yard sale where it'll be sold for, for 50 cents. And it's the same way with design of mechanical components, specifically for firearm components. 
If you don't hit every one of those design specifications, something is going to be lacking. And this component that you want to work so well is going to be an annoyance. And what we've tried to do here is to make this handguard do what it's supposed to and do it well. The second part of that is execution. And this is what I learned when I was 15 years old. I learned how to make things and make it well and make it right. And if you're familiar with Geisley products, when you get it in your hands, you can look at it and you can say, it's beautiful. Somebody put a lot of thought into this. And that's what you're gonna see with our rails, that somebody put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into making it. And I have to say right here, thank you to Mr. Donardo for everything that he taught me. And you're gonna enjoy the fruits of that labor of him and me when I was young, when he was teaching me these things. You're going to enjoy that when you purchase this handguard. Now we're going to go into the installation sequence of this. And uh, I'll show you how we're going to install a handguard right from the get-go on this Colt 6920 rifle. Do you want to go into this, Larry? I'd like to if you... If you want to uh, take a break or we can go ahead. I'd like to keep going. Okay. Are you good? good. You need a drink or anything? I'm fine. All right. We're going to install the handguard now on a, on a stock Colt 6920. This installation process is going to be very detailed. I am not making this video for the experienced armorer or for the experienced gunsmith. We're going to go into very minute detail and this video is meant for all you guys that want to work on your own guns but you not, might not be a gunsmith your career path not, might not have taken you into precision machined mechanical components like mine has. You may be a lawyer, you may be a truck driver, you could be a police officer, and working on guns may not be second nature. To me, a lot of things are not second nature to me, and I'll tell you one is working on houses, doing drywall, things like that. You don't want Bill Geisley to do that. You don't want me to work with wood. I can't do it but God gave me the skills here to be able to work with these precision components and I'm going to try to show you all the different steps to putting this handguard on. So just bear with me if you're experienced at this you're going to get bored but uh, I hope you'll find it informative. First thing you do always make sure your weapon is unloaded and you're going to pull your upper receiver off. We're then going to remove the stock hand guards and you pull down on your delta ring and you slide one out and you slide the other out. We're now going to hold this because we're going to be doing some work on the upper receiver and you have to hold this upper receiver and here's going to be uh, where you need some specialized tools. If you want to work on your gun you're just going to have to purchase them. First thing you're going to need is a bench vise. And right here we have a large bench vise. This is Starrett. It's made in Massachusetts. Um, I purchased this quite some time ago. They don't make these anymore. There's many manufacturers of bench vices in the United States. Wilton makes one. Um, Yoast. You can go to Harbor Freight and purchase one made overseas. I'm going to discourage you from that because I always encourage that folks buy parts and things like that for their workshop made in the United States. But you may not have the scratch to drop three or four hundred dollars on a bench vise, and you can go there and buy one for thirty-five dollars. 
um, whatever you want to do. I'm going to encourage you to buy U.S. You can go on eBay and purchase bench vices. Um, that's a great place to find some older ones. You want one with a minimum four inch jaw width. This one's four and a half right here. The bigger you get, the bigger the bench vice is. Four inch is a nice gunsmith size. Now we have to hold this upper receiver. There's a couple ways you do that. The most popular is something like this. This is a uh, vice block. This one here is made by PRANA, Lakeland, Florida. These are commonly available from any of your, uh, your Midway USA or Brownells. And what they do is you can basically put your receiver in, clamp it closed, and you can put this in your bench vise. All right, this is one way to do things. I don't care for it too much because when you're working on this right here, any torque that you put on the barrel nut, you're also torquing on your upper receiver. And I, I don't like doing that. And we have another way of doing things here, and I'll show you that. We have a tool, and we are not the originators of this tool. There's a tool very similar to this uh, that the Army Marksmanship uses. But what it is is a, uh, I call it a barrel vice rod. And this is a piece of uh, hardened chrome molly has two flats cut on it that you clamp with your bench vise and here is a is a spline profile that is in the shape of the AR-15 bolt so what you do is you put this guy in it latches into your barrel extension and then what you do is you can tighten this up and now this is held. You can put this on, rotate it. You can work on your sights on here. You pull it right off, put it right on. And now all the torque that you're gonna be putting in your barrel nut goes into your barrel extension and that's what holds it. This is not being held by anything. So your first step here is you're gonna to have to remove your flash hider. And I need a wrench, which I have to step away from this real quick to get. Larry, if you go in that toolbox right there, there is an adjustable wrench somewhere. And I can come over if I need to. Should be fairly big. It's silver in one of those lower drawers in that red toolbox. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. Needed to get a tool that I didn't have. Here we're going to use an adjustable wrench. Uh, I believe this is uh, three quarters of an inch right here. You can use a three quarter inch spanner. And uh, we're going to pull this off. It's a right hand thread. And I had to try to see which way it went because I wasn't facing it. And here we go. Pull your flash hider off and your crush washer. Now you have to remove your front sight block and your gas tube. This is in preparation for removing your stock barrel nut right here that you have to do. This front sight block is held on with something called a, two taper pins. What a taper pin is, it's, it's, a, it's an old millwright way of holding things like couplings uh, together to a shaft or sometimes electric motors were taper pinned down to their base in order to hold them in place. And uh, use of taper pins goes back even before the 1920s. Here's a large one. This is pretty much I think the largest they make right here. And what this is, it's a one, this is a seven inch long taper pin and the taper of every taper pin, no matter how small it is, 
is a quarter inch per foot. So the included angle is about one degree and 11 minutes. And I'll talk about why that's important here as we remove this. The taper pins always go in from one side on this front sight base. And if you look at it, it's by inspection, they go in from the bolt catch side. This is the side that you've got to push from. And you can just look at the ends of it. One's small, one's large. Put it on your bench, put it on a piece, piece of soft wood so you don't damage your handguard sheet metal piece. Do you want to come over here, Larry? I'll wait for you. Now you're going to need a punch for this. One of the tools you're going to have to get is a hammer, which I don't have in front of me, and I'm going to have to get a hammer here. Hold on one second, folks. Okay, there's one in there. Should be a, should be like a steel-faced hammer, medium-sized. Same thing, down in one of those. That'll work. No, 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 no. we need to steal one, Larry. Hey, Chris! Chris! He can't hear me. Yeah, perfect. All right, we're back. Now that we got the correct hammer here. Notice what kind of hammer this is. This is called a ball peen hammer. If you're gonna work on guns, you're gonna need one of these, not a claw hammer. A claw hammer is made for working on wood. It is not made for striking against metal. You will not get the correct energy when you hit with a claw hammer on anything you're working on. You want the ball peen hammer. We also have something called a taper punch. This one here is about six inches long. You can buy these from many sources. You can get them at Sears stores, hardware stores. You can purchase them. I like purchasing tools through McMaster Car. Uh, they have an extremely good website and they have just about anything you could need for uh, a laboratory or a mechanical shop and uh, it's called a taper punch here. This is a snap-on 3 16 inch. Now you want to use this, you don't want to use a straight punch. Straight punch has a straight shaft and the reason is is because this straight shaft and impact is completely different from the taper or the starter punch here. This is much more rigid. Much more your hammer blow energy is going to go into what you're hitting rather with this. It seems like I'm splitting hairs. Who cares? You're going to hit it. Trust me. There are times when I cannot remove pins with a straight punch where a starter punch will get it going and then you can finish up with this. So what you do, I put this on a soft piece of wood right here of course I have a wooden bench and you take your starter punch here and you're going to tap right on the end of your pin punch. And there that moved it. And you'll notice I'm not being gentle with this. Okay, I pushed it out and now we get the appropriate pin punch and you can see right here you don't even have to pin punch these things out they fall right out except that one okay here's your taper pins you don't want to lose them they're special they're non-commercial they're a special length you it's going to be impossible for you to see the taper between these two but essentially this big brother has the exact same taper of a quarter inch per foot of this. And you saw how tight these guys were. They're just driven in. What happens is that taper 
because it is below four to six degrees, it's self-locking. A general rule of thumb for mechanical design is that at four and six, six degrees, you have self-locking with a wedge. When these go in, they will not come out because they're literally expanding metal around these taper pins. And that metal is cinching onto the taper pin and it won't come out. Now at the same time, there's some problems with that, namely that I believe they put a speed bump in the board, which isn't good. But there's an awful lot of M4 carbine barrels out there and M16s that have taper pins in them and they shoot very well. Now you're gonna have to take your front sight off. This one has a, a, uh, uh, a sling swivel that's taper pinned to this, but I believe if we tap on this guy right here, it'll all come off at once. Note that when this comes off, it may rub on your finish here. Be very careful. If you're hitting this with a soft face hammer, if it's tight, know that once this comes off of the 750 diameter right here that this front sight fits on, it's going to start to rub on here and you'll gouge up your parkerized or your stainless steel finish if you have a stainless barrel. So just be careful with it. You want me to keep going, Larry? Okay, our next step here is we're going to salvage the gas tube from this gas block. If you have a new gas tube, you don't have to remove it. Now this step here can be pretty darn difficult and the reason is there's a carbon steel roll pin that holds this gas block in. And unless you have a new gun, most likely that's going to be frozen in place from a lot of the combustion gases that can rust at. There's a way to do this. It's my way, there may be other ways out there, but I can only recommend two tools to do this. They're both punches from Snap-on. Snap-on is a, uh, an automotive and industrial supplier of very quality tools, very good quality tools. They're extremely expensive. I, I believe these guys are somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 bucks, $13 each. But they're the only ones that are small enough and strong enough to do this properly. Again, if you have a new weapon, it's not gonna be an issue. If you have an old one, you're going to need these two tools. I believe you can order them online from Snap-on. Your starter punch here is a Snap-on 1 16th serial number, P, uh, model number PPC405A, PPC405A. And your pin punch 1 16th PPC402A, PPC402A. First thing you do, you get some crawl, very good penetrating solvent. Put it on that roll pin, get a little bit down here. Start with your starter punch. I have this on a piece of wood. Now you heard that first tap, that was tight, and the second one broke it loose. Now we can go with our pin punch. Now, if the pin punch is hard to tap, if that thing, if that little roll pin does not move right off the bat, do not force it because this will bend. And once that bends, you will not be able to get a good hit on that. You have to break it loose with the starter punch first. Now your gas tube comes out. You're not gonna use your front sight base. We have a gas tube to use for our project. All right. Now we're going to remove the stock barrel nut. The upper receiver goes back on our barrel vice rod. Now we're going to make this barrel vice rod available here. Um, it's something we use internally and we have plans to make it. So uh, we'll have this at a nominal price 
for everybody that wants to wants to use one. It's a good tool. You notice your barrel nut wrench. There's a square right here. This is for a half inch drive. And what we're going to do is you can use a half inch drive ratchet or a torque wrench. Uh, you don't really want to break things off with a torque wrench, but it's designed for a half inch drive. If you have a three inch drive, you're going to need an adapter. And we're going to put this on with our tool that I don't have in front of me. Okay. It is Chris. Hey, honey, get Chris. I need him to get a ratchet out of there. A ratchet. Chris. Chris, I need a half inch drive ratchet that's in that toolbox. Right here, red one right here, bub. One of the top drawers, half inch drive ratchet. Top drawers, like the top, top drawer in that. You got a half inch drive? Hold it up. No, that's three eighths, bigger. Yeah, that's it. Okay. All right, we're back. Here's our barrel nut wrench. We're gonna take a half inch drive ratchet Again, this here is a snap-on, but anything that you get out there will work. A breaker bar is good too. You'll notice your half-inch drive has a little scallop cut right here on top, and that's for this little ball. It makes it a little bit easier to get out. Pop this on. Bring this over to your delta ring. And what we're gonna do is we gotta go through the other side here, excuse me. Position this correctly. Okay. Once you get that around the scallops on your stock barrel nut, hold it on, you're pushing your delta ring back, put pressure on it, watch your fingers, you break it loose. stock barrel nut and your delta ring assembly and you discard it. You're not going to be using it. Take your barrel out and you can see how this works. That's how that barrel vise rod fits on there. Clean it. Clean your barrel. Clean your upper receiver. Make sure when you put the barrel on that that little alignment dowel right there fits into the corresponding groove in the upper receiver. Clean your threads and now you're going to lubricate them. You can use oil to do this. I prefer grease. Any kind of lubricant will work. Any seize is fine. Just take that and you're going to lubricate your threads. This here's standard lubriflate grease. Make sure you get the face of the barrel extension on your barrel. Make sure you get that face there. There's going to be a lot of torque. Well, not a lot, the proper amount. Now take your Geisley barrel nut, slide it on the barrel, screw it on. Okay, now you need to tighten it up. When a stock barrel nut is tightened, the lower torque limit is 30 foot-pounds. You're supposed to tighten this to 30 and then go all the way up to 80 as you attempt to align these scallops with your gas tube. This is easier said than done. Once you do this a lot of times, it's easier, but so many times one of these scallops will come out of time with your gas tube hole in your receiver and, tight, and you're physically incapable 
of tightening up the gas tube, the gas, the barrel nut, so that it lines up correctly. You will ruin your, your barrel nut, you will cause some kind of damage. It is just in between these scallops. The beauty of this barrel nut here is that you don't have to worry about it. You're just going to tighten this up and be done with it. No indexing necessary. Now we're going to use a torque wrench here. You don't have to. Barrel nuts have been tightened up right from the get-go without a torque wrench. Um, certainly it's almost impossible to line those scallops up with a torque wrench once you get it to 30 foot-pounds. But in this case, we're going to show you how this is done. This is a torque wrench here. Again, it's a snap-on torque wrench. You do not need one of these guys. You can purchase a torque wrench. I, I purchased a torque wrench from eBay the other day for $16. Just make sure that it's in foot-pounds, not inch-pounds, like I did. I bought it in inch-pounds when I was hoping it was a foot-pound one, and I could show you how easy it was to get a cheap torque wrench. It was an SK, which is a good make. 16 bucks. This guy here is probably 200 or so. 50 foot pounds. Now, take your little round boss here and you're going to put it in one of the holes here in your barrel nut. Okay? And we're going to tighten it up. There's two of them. Put it on. Done. You feel that pop? That's your barrel. That's your torque wrench telling you you've reached foot, 50 foot-pounds. Now, if you know anything about torque wrench extensions, you're physically not putting on 50 foot-pounds because you've extended your reach of your torque wrench right here. Don't worry about it. You're putting probably in the neighborhood of 57, 58 foot-pounds on here, and that's fine. Now that your barrel nut's on, we're going to go and we're going to install a low profile gas block and your gas tube. Let's come over here to our bench and we're going to choose just a generic low profile gas block. I say generic, I, there's many people out there who make these guys. Um, some are better quality than others. We've had good luck with this one right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to install our gas tube. You might want to clean it off a little bit better than I'm doing right here, but the carbon's not going to hurt anything. You see this little cutout right here, this little hole. This hole here is what that little roll pin has to align itself on. It has to be put on the right way. Okay. Your bend has to be up, can't be down, okay, when you put this in. So as you look at it, make sure your bend is up. Your scallop here for your gas that comes up through this is down. You slide this guy on. Physically line your hole up for your roll pin. And now you got to get your roll pin in. Easier said than done. It's going to be hard for you to hold this roll pin and tap this guy in. And we have a special tool here that I first saw from one of the guys at Compass Lake Engineering who installed these things. He showed me, so we made our own little thing, and it's a little piece of drill rod. This is a little piece of drill rod with just an 085 hole drilled in the end, 100,000 deep. And what it does is it'll hold your roll pin and allow you to get it started here. We're going to tap this with our... Okay, now we're going to get our pin punch. We're going to drive this a little farther. This time we're going to use a smaller hammer than before. Get it close. Transfer over to even a smaller punch. There we go. Yep, came out the other side a little bit. I'm gonna make it a bit flush, more flush. All right, there we are. Now we're gonna move and we're gonna install this on the rifle. 
going to take our gas block and our gas tube that's been installed and we're going to we're going to install it on the barrel now to see how easy that slid on there if it doesn't a lot of times there's a burr on the ID of these gas blocks um, a lot of them are made in a very, very careless manner if you get a burr on it, don't force it. Pull it off, get in there with a little scraper or a little piece of emery cloth and pull that burr off until this will slide on very nicely. Now you got to align your gas block. Now, different people have different thoughts on this. Uh, I believe that what you need to do is instead of looking at the hole on the gas block to make sure that it lines up with the hole in the barrel, just understand that the hole in the gas block where this gas ports through is much bigger than that hole. It doesn't have to be an exact alignment. What you're worried about is how your gas tube goes into the upper receiver and how your bolt carrier interfaces with that gas tube. You don't want to have any binding there on the bolt carrier. So what I do is I put this on and then I look right at this interface right here and all I do is I visually line up the gas tube until it's in the center of that receiver and you can see I'm going to this edge I'm moving over here it touches I get it right in the middle so it's free now this is a clamp on gas block there's different kinds some have set screws some are clamp on it's your preference what you want to use I prefer the clamp on type once you tighten that up, just go back, make sure it's in the center. Give it a little bit more torque. And now you're going to take a bolt carrier that does not have a bolt in it. You're going to remove it. You're going to slide this on and you're going to make sure that that fits in nicely without any binding on that gas tube. These gas tubes can get bent and if they get bent it will bind. And now that your gas block is on you want to tighten it up fully and again people have different thoughts on this. I prefer that when I'm doing this I take green cylindrical locking compound that's made by Loctite. Uh, there's different uh, grades of it. I believe we use 608 Degrease your barrel, degrease your gas block, put that locking compound on, get your gas tube in there, and lock it in place with locking compound and your clamp bolts. This here, in the interest of uh, expediency, we're not going to use that Loctite right now. We're just going to clamp this up. Okay. Now we're ready for our handguard. Look at your two anti-rotation screws. Just make sure that they're screwed back out of the bore. Now before you do this, what I recommend is your first time that you're doing it, you put a little bit of oil, in this case I'm just going to use Kroll, onto your barrel nut. And all this is is for you to get a little familiar with how this rail goes on this gas block. It just makes it a little easier and once you get the hang of putting it on it's no big deal you don't need oil on it. The cylindrical fit between the gas nut, I mean, um, excuse me, the cylindrical fit the cylindrical fit between the barrel nut and the rail is in the neighborhood of a thousandths of an inch. In other words there's a thousandths of an inch clearance. This does not get forced on here. If you remember, every handguard is shipped. The bolts were in here and so was the barrel nut when you pulled it out. There's no forcing. If you have to force it, something's wrong. Slide this on. Okay, bring it up against your barrel nut. And now you go to this end. You don't leave this cocked. You just center it. 
you wiggle this a little bit, you center it on the barrel, you don't leave it cocked and try to jam it on. And what you have is it goes on and you'll notice, watch the handguard slip over the upper receiver. There you go, it's on. Now, you'll notice how tight this is. What you see shaking is the whole thing. It's not the handguard. That is such a nice and tight, precisely machined fit. You don't even need these screws for this guy to be rigid. All right? So we take our locking screws, install it. If it doesn't go in at first, just wiggle your handguard back and forth until it gets in the center of the groove and start tightening it up. You'll notice that they stop after a couple turns. And the reason for this is on this side of the handguard, there are Healy coil stainless steel inserts that are installed. So the screw threads do not go directly into aluminum. These locking inserts, these stainless steel Healy coils are locking to the locking type. In other words, one of the threads is deformed so it grips the threads of the bolts that go into there, that go into that go through it. And this means that once you tighten, once you get past that deformed insert, these bolts are not going to come out. They stay in there. No matter what. They wouldn't tighten up when they wouldn't loosen up if they're tight anyways. But now they're really not going to loosen up. So what you do is you take, in this case, this tool here, this is a tool I used to use when I worked on motorcycles, but uh, a 3 8 12 point socket. Okay? Take this on, tighten these guys up. You have to put, you have to drive it on. You're not gonna be able to do it by hand. You don't tighten it, leave it loose. Now, if you don't want have a socket, you can use alternatively a couple different ways. One is a 12 point wrench. You put this on and tighten it with a 12 point wrench. If you have a Leatherman Mutt multi-tool that has an included wrench with it that is 3 8 12 point, you can use that to tighten it up. And in a pinch, you can take your bolt carrier and bolt out, and you see that cross that's in the center. You can take one of your locking lugs, put it in here, and you can use this as a wrench. So you can remove this on and off in the field without tools, except for that little Allen key right there. All right, and this little trick feature, I can take no credit for it. The original HK416 came with this little cross in there, so this is HK's idea. Now, this rail, if you notice, it can only rotate a slight amount before this part of the rail comes in contact with the upper receiver. It's restrained, restrained from going forward and backwards from these bolts that are caught into the grooves of the barrel nut. And here's a section barrel nut right here. All right. And these bolts go right through here partially. So they, re they restrain this from going backwards and forwards. It's not going to move up and down. It's not going to go that way. It's not going to rotate this way. The only way it can go rotate is this. All right. So what you got to do is, at this point, you're going to time this M1913 rail that's on top of the handguard. You're going to time it to this. A couple ways you can do it. Some people use levels. I do not recommend that because any level that you put on this that is going to go across that short length, you're never going to get a good reading out of it. What I recommend doing is taking a sight base like this nice one here from LaRue. Changing the two, like so. And just partially tightening up your sight now. And that is going to time these two to the scope, to the scope mount right here. That's all it is. You don't even have to fully tighten it. You can have a scope on here. And now you're going to tighten your two screws. Now there is a torque value that I have on here. It's 10 foot-pounds. 
That is for fellas who don't twerk all the time so you can get an idea how tight you have to make this. As you can see, you go back and forth and these bolts will lock right up, okay? When they lock up, you don't have to put more than just a little bit more on there. And what that's doing is it's collapsing this structure of the rail around the barrel nut, that 1,000 sub an inch, and it's gripping it very, very tightly and retaining the alignment of the rail to the barrel. Now our first generation rails did not have this type of anti-rotation feature that I'm going to show you. They did not come over the upper receiver like this. Right now you cannot turn this even if you abuse the weapon. In order to turn this rail on the barrel nut, I've done this experiment where I've had to put an 18 inch long strap wrench on this rail in order to get it to move on there. Right now it will not move under any normal or any abusive situation. However, we wanted to make this bomb proof and that's why we have these two little set screws here. You don't have to use them if you don't want. They're nylon tipped so they're not going to mar your receiver. But what you can do is now you just screw these guys against your receiver and it is locked in place for rotation. It will not turn. They have a little bit of locking compound on there so you don't have to put anything. There you go. If you didn't want to use them, you don't have to. Worst case scenario, even if you forgot and left these guys loose, what you're going to see is the only amount that this would be able to turn is approximately a 30 second on the side. So there you go. There's your rail. It's installed. And now we're going to put on our flash hider. I'm not going to pay too close attention to this. It is a three-quarter inch wrench and I do have the proper wrench now instead of an adjustable. Time this guy up properly. And let's put this on the gun and see what it's like. There you go. Instead of a little short piece, now you have this very nice long rail that fits your hands very well. You can extend your arm out from it. It's very, very natural, very smooth. And now we can put some accessory rails on this guy. Let's take this short one. Now one thing to notice, this is round. And if you look at the accessory rail on the bottom, you'll see some pretty neat machining here. You notice this profile, this profile of the accessory rail is round. Yet it has these bosses in here. This is done by 3D machining. We come in here with a little ball end mill and sweep it back and forth, back and forth in order to make this round profile that fits against this very well and yet you have your two shear lugs. Now I don't re recommend using any type of Loctite on these screws. You can if you want, but the only one to use if you're going to put these things on and call it semi-permanent is Loctite 222. It's the purple type. Do not use blue. Do not use red. You might get these screws completely seized in there with that type of Loctite and you're not going to be able to get them out without damaging the rail. These guys are in there very snug and as you can see look how nice that accessory rail 
Larry, forgive me for pointing this at you. Open this up. You can see how nice that accessory rail meets up with the handguard. It's a simple matter here. Mount your lights, fit your tape switches wherever you want. They fit very nice down in these 45s. Now, one of the good things about this rail is that it's easy to remove. Let's just say right now you want to go back in and uh, you want to lock tight that gas block. Okay, I'm going to move here to the bench. Now you don't need to use this barrel vise rod. You can do this in your hand, okay? Not necessary. Just for convenience sake, we're gonna do it. Take your 564th Allen key, run these screws out. Take your two cross bolt bolts completely out. You can see I don't have to put a ton of torque to remove it. That gives you an idea how tight to make this. Remove your bolts. There goes your handguard. It's easy to install another one. Equipped a different way. Now you can work on your gas block. Just go through this fairly quickly. Make sure you move this around if it doesn't go on. Just take your hand guard and move it a little bit back and forth. Your screws will go on. Partially tighten them. Take your scope mount. Time this up. Brownells makes a nice tool that'll bridge these that you can use to align it if you don't want to use a scope mount. Tighten up your little set screws. just until they touch the receiver. There you go. There you go. Hand guards, easy to install. It's easy to remove. It's rigid. It's ergonomic. It's strong. It's free floating. It's flexible and modular. The accessory rails are easy to install and the accessory rails are strong. This here meets all the design specifications of a good rail. I think you'll like it. I want to thank you for listening to me uh, yak on here today. And I know this has been a, a long video and I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much.